and welcome to the session 1e on sustainability in the built environment um, i'm hosting it together with uh, lloyd and uh, our first presentation is sustainable building renovation and indoor environmental quality and that's uh, raghad walla and fatima um, is that the first one lloyd it is. Here we go. Thank yep. you. Hello, everyone. My name is Fatma Osman, and I will be presenting a paper on sustainable building renovation and indoor environmental quality. The paper was developed by three authors, which are Associate Professor Wala Salah, Architect Rawat Sameh, and myself. relationship between building construction and indoor air quality has been identified in various previous research. It was found that 30% of buildings worldwide receive high number of health-related complaints. The main cause of this percentage is the excessive amount of pollutants released during the construction process. In this research, the focus will be on the scope of building renovation as they involve a considerable amount of construction, demolition, and finishings, leading to the release of excessive amount of air pollutants and this leads to unsuitable indoor air quality. The aim of this research is to investigate the relationship between building renovation, indoor air quality, and sick building syndrome. This will be done through investigating previous literature as well as validating the literature outcome through application on a renovation process done in an educational building. This will result in providing recommendation for proper planning of the renovation process. In this research, there are main three topics, which are renovation work, indoor air quality, and sick building syndrome. The research methodology followed two approaches in order to assess them. First, a qualitative approach which assessed each of the three topics individually, then identified the relationship between them. The investigation was done on a three years period published in Scopus database. The second approach was the case study investigation where each topic was assessed thoroughly through different methods as presented in the figure. Literature review. First, the renovation work. During the investigation, it was found that renovation practices and material selection were the main cause of pollutants released. For material selection, the investigation focused on finishings, where they are categorized into three groups, walls, floors, and ceilings. Each has different layers and various selection of materials with different chemical compositions. For the renovation practices, it was found that although these activities are temporary, they release excessive amount of pollutants, making building renovation a less sustainable solution if not managed properly. For the indoor air quality, investigation of literature showed three directions of research. First, identify the level of air pollutants as particulate matter in interior spaces, where all results proved that it constitutes of health hazardous agent. The second one is to determine the average duration needed to regain a safe emission level, where studies indicated that degradation of emission might take from 2 to 8 weeks, where to regain normal levels of emission mission it might take up to three months the third one is material selection for this direction different assessment methods and different sets of material were used among various selection of studies however all of them prove that chemical composition of materials has harmful impact on indoor air quality from the previous three directions uh, air pollutants such as particulate matter and volatile organic compounds were defined and their characteristics was identified. Moreover, measuring methods were identified uh, in order uh, to help measure the chemical standards and percentage during the renovation process. Finally, laws and standards related to indoor air quality were identified to be used in the case study. For the application part, the case study selected discussed the renovation activities of an educational building within the British University in Egypt. Four different spaces were selected with different areas and occupancy rate. 
This method was done on three steps. First, observation of the practice undertaken by labor during the renovation process. Second, lab tests were performed on different painting materials using gas chromatography tests. Third, a questionnaire was done to identify sick building syndrome in the short term and long term on different uh, occupants of the spaces. For the results, four observations were concluded from the first step. Number one, labor did not adhere to safety regulations. Two, floor replacement process were identified in six steps. Number three, ceiling renovation were limited to replacement of panels. Number four, wall painting replacement took place using traditional methods. Uh, this was followed by a lab test for the painting products which indicated that they adhere to the Egyptian environmental law. Uh, furthermore, a gas chromatography analysis uh, showed that the white coating had the highest VOC concentration. Uh, in the uh, presented figure, each uh, painting material uh, is connected with the room it was used in. Uh, the white coating uh, was used in the lecture hall. Uh, where it showed that it had a reduced uh, impact uh, or symptoms. Uh, this is due to its large size and proper ventilation. As for the labs, it had higher symptoms. Uh, this is uh, caused by its small size. For the offices, although they are narrower in space, they recorded lower symptoms, uh, which is due to having better ventilation and less occupant numbers. The final space is the classroom which recorded the highest impact due to its small area and relatively large number of occupants. As for the questionnaire, it investigated the effects on different occupants as workers, students and staff. For the short term, 84% of the occupants experienced the same symptoms of nose and eye mucous membrane irritations, discomfort in the respiratory system, dizziness, and asthma. This affected the student's ability to comprehend and increased the need for the sick leaves for the staff. As for the long term, the symptoms gradually decreased except for those with asthma. Although focusing on material selection and renovation process showed severe impact on the indoor air quality and occupant health, other factors were not studied that are used in some renovation process, as demolition and adding new constructions. Furthermore, the materials assessment was done on a small set of materials in the case study. These results highlight that using suitable materials may not be enough to guarantee sustainable revenue renovation process. Uh, also, the practice has to be improved uh, and the indoor air quality has to be monitored and controlled from the early stages of the renovation process. To conclude, the study pinpointed the importance of adopting a sustainable approach for building renovation in an educational faculty and its direct effect on indoor air quality through an investigation through the published literature in three years, uh, an investigation on the long-term and short-term health effects for a number of full-time and transit occupants. Uh, this study focused on two parameters only, which are the selection of building material and construction best practice. It included only the finishing part uh, of the walls, floors, and ceilings. Uh, the study concludes with uh, three main recommendations, which are source control, referring to material selection in terms of quality and quantity. Uh, second, adhering to acceptable emission level and exposure period according to the international standards. Uh, finally, monitoring indoor air quality is very important from the early stages of the construction to ensure workers follow safety regulation and in international standards. Thank you. Uh, Walla and Fatima. I think we've got Fatima here, but I'm going to uh, hold on for to the end of all of the presentations um, until we uh, um, present to, till we open up for questions. But it does it does provide does um, 
certainly bring a lot of questions to mind um, and I, I've certainly got questions uh, at the end of, of this presentation. Um, well, we'll now move on to the next question presentation, which is a dilemma between building indoor environments I've just lost that. A building indoor environmental preferences and occupant energy behaviors. And that's Achini, uh, Ezaku, and James. Thank you, Lloyd. Kia ora from New Zealand. I hope everyone is doing well and safe. My name is Achini Veera Singha. I am a PhD student at the School of Built Environment, Massey University. Before I start, I want you to picture yourself in your office. Have you ever tried opening windows or closing blinds and shades? Or bring in a heater or fan from your home and adjust, the, adjust those appearances at the workplace? But have you ever wondered why you do those actions and how those actions might impact energy. Welcome to my research, a dilemma between building indoor environment preferences and occupant energy behaviors. My co-authors are Associate Professor James Rotimi and Dr. Isia Kurashid. In this presentation, I am going to discuss the introduction, methods and the results and finally the conclusion. Studies say most people spend 90% of their time in indoors. Be it at your office or home, when you stay longer at one place, you may eventually try to feel comfortable within that environment and take unconscious and conscious actions to improve your comfort levels. These actions refer to occupant energy behaviors, including occupant's presence, movement and their interaction with building systems and elements. Therefore, the occupant should not compromise the energy savings of the building when they modulate their comfort. It was found these energy behaviors increase the building energy demand. The uncertainty of occupant behaviors driven by the complex and dynamic factors cause a difference between predicted and actual energy use. Therefore, existing occupant energy behavior models require further improvements. However, limited research is available globally and mainly in the New Zealand context to, in terms of identifying surrounding indoor environment, occupant comfort preferences and other influential factors, as well as in terms of bringing these different components together and link with occupant energy behaviors. Therefore, the current study trying to address these gaps. This slide explains an overview of research methods. We have used a quantitative approach with the questionnaire survey administered through the Caltrix survey platform. The questionnaire consisted of four sections. All measures related to satisfaction were estimated by a Likert type item of 1 to 7, ranging from completely dissatisfied to completely satisfied. This is a good indicator of subjective aspects of occupant behaviors and these aspects can be used to identify the triggers of occupant behaviors. University staff and PhD students who are regularly in the office were conveniently recruited from five buildings. Emails were sent to potential respondents of 257. However, only a third total of 46 valid responses were collected and after that, uh, the data were collected using frequency analysis and experiment correlation. In terms of reliability, Conbach's alpha value for the current uh, study is 0.716, which shows an acceptable level of reliability for 13 constructs of this study. Demographic information of participants indicated that there were more males than females in selected sample. Also, most participants had worked in their present work area for a year or more than a year, so they are well familiar with the workspace. Most participants were in shared offices that accommodate two to five people, and both the staff and the students occupy the three types of office spaces, private, shared, and open plan. 
The current study compares the occupant satisfaction level and practice of occupant behaviors across three OPIS types, uh, private, shared, and open, open plan offices. More than 70% of occupants were satisfied with visual comfort and furniture arrangement. This could be due to there were Venetian blinds and roller shades in the selected buildings to control external aluminum levels. Furthermore, 50% or more than 50% of occupants indicated that they are somewhat satisfied or higher in terms of thermal comfort in winter, acoustic comfort and user control in lighting. In this end, that can be assumed that the double glazed windows of the buildings act as an excellent link in thermal performance, preventing cold in winter and also in acoustic comfort preventing external noise penetration. However, occupants are less satisfied with ventilation due to lack of operable windows. Also, uh, they are not happy with thermal comfort in summer and the control in heating, cooling, ventilation and uh, noise. The median values of the satisfaction rating given by the building occupants across three offices were compared and summarized here. As you can see here, similar values of satisfaction were observed in visual comfort, furniture arrangement, ventilation in summer, and user control in heating, ventilation, no uh, noise, and cooling. Across the three office types, Again, the highest satisfaction was observed in visual comfort and furniture arrangement, whereas dissatisfaction was recorded in terms of ventilation in summer and user control in heating, ventilation, noise and cooling. In open plan offices, occupants were highly satisfied with thermal comfort in winter and acoustic comfort. However, in shared offices, occupants were highly satisfied with access to lighting control. And also, the occupants were not asked to mention the reason for their satisfaction level. Therefore, the reason for these similarities and disparities are unknown currently. 15 occupant behaviors and 15 comfort preferences were identified referring to previous studies. The occupants were asked to select the occupant behaviors they practiced during work and the expected changes from these behaviors. As you can see here, more than 70% of the occupants selected opening closing windows and drinking hot cold beverages. Whereas 50% uh, or more than 50% responded on opening closing internal doors, turning lights on off, adjusting clothing, shades and blinds, computer screen, screen brightness, and personal heaters. Considering comfort preferences, more than 70% of the occupants expected to let in the pressure to feel cooler and to feel warmer, mainly through opening closing windows uh, or drinking hot cold beverages and adjusting clothing and personal heaters. As well as more than 50% of uh, occupants expected to increase air movement, possibly through opening closing windows and internal doors. Likewise, other behaviors could also relate to the occupants' expectations. According to the occupants, frequency of occupant behavior practice is often and the influence of occupant behaviors was influential. Finally, the Spearman correlation was run for the study. Accordingly, most of the independent variables show a moderately significant relationship with the influence of occupant behavior, except furniture arrangement, office type, and frequency of occupant behaviors. Overall, parameters related to ventilation, comfort, and control of heating, cooling, and ventilation have the strongest bond with the occupant behaviors. In the current study, it was concluded that occupants across private, shared and, and open plan offices have a similar value of satisfaction for most parameters. Furthermore, the current study reinforces the association of occupant behaviors with indoor environmental conditions. Also, it was found that the control over thermal and IAQ related parameters have the strongest bond with occupant behaviors in office buildings. 
Accordingly, the study showcases the relationship of occupant behaviors with comfort preferences and drivers of occupant behaviors. Further recommends a better understanding of these relationships and has future occupant energy behavior modeling to reduce the gap between predicted and actual energy use and also pinpoint the occupant's energy wasteful behaviors thereby support policymakers, design and building managers to optimize the building energy performance from a building's design and construction stage. However, the current study is limited to a small sample size which was selected purposively. Therefore, extended research is to be conducted to come up with an interdisciplinary framework for occupant energy behaviors. Thank you for listening. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for that, Achini. Um, that was a really interesting presentation and um, uh, certainly looking forward to engaging some questions uh, on maybe the next stages of that uh, research. Um, so we I think that we were now moving on to uh, what is our final presentation for this session then we'll open up for discussions um, so introducing circular innovation in the construction industry the case for of the circular viaduct and that's Tom Lenje and Kalasane thank you Lloyd can you start that last presentation I'm a doctoral student at the University of Twente and together with Leentje Volker and Klaas Visser, I studied the transition towards a circular infrastructure sector in the Netherlands. Today I will tell you about our findings regarding a specific innovation trajectory in the light of circularity transition in the infrastructure domain. Before I start, first we need to ask a question. Why a transition towards a circular infrastructure sector? The infrastructure sector is largely public and is highly dependent on procurement law. It is traditionally known for difficulties in collaboration, change, and the diffusion of innovation. In addition, the infrastructure sector is highly resource intensive and huge generator of waste. Several national and supranational agreements were made on this topic, including several goals and accompanying strategies to become circular in the next 30 years. Beyond new technologies and processes, also social and institutional changes are required to really come to such a system in which circularity is the default mode. We studied how a single circular innovation developed through time and how it required changes in, for example, collaboration structures or legislation to eventually lead to circular practices. The case we studied is a viaduct that was modularly designed and built out of standardized elements. The viaduct was assembled and disassembled on site and is designed for reuse and adaption to fit any new situation. Using the Mission Oriented Innovation System or MIS or MIS framework, the full innovation trajectory is reconstructed from first idea to implementation, implementation to follow up initiatives. Such a MIS study comprises first an analysis of the problem and solution directions with respect to the mission, second a structural outline of the studied system, and third a functional analysis to identify the system dynamics. In the remainder of this presentation I will focus on the last functional analysis. However, to give you an idea first I will present a general overview of the process from idea up to the current situation. It all started small as a market initiative on account of only several individuals who knew each other from a working group on sustainable concrete. Despite the enthusiasm of individuals at all organizations, formalization turned out to be difficult, especially due to a lack of formal assignment funds and wider support. And only after a long struggle, funds and construction location were found at the client side. And after that point, the execution went relatively smoothly including completion of the final designs and eventual construction. After completion, lessons were shared and follow-up initiatives were discussed in network events. Finally, several circularity aim tenders were issued with the aim to explore new solution directions for construction, constructing new circular viaducts that are currently being executed. Now, the general overview of the narrative is clear. I will take you to the outcomes of the functional analysis. The reconstruction was done 
by making an overview of all events of its previous slide gave a general overview such as and such events are all things that affect the course of the trajectory and uh, next each event was linked to one of the functions on the slide. In brief, the functions are the following. Function one is about the market that experiments, explores and innovates within a certain mission. Function two is about the development of knowledge needed to develop and implement solutions. Function three is about networks, databases, platforms, relationships through which the knowledge is shared. Function four is first about the debate on what the actual problems are behind the mission. And function 4b is about what the most suitable solution directions are and hence what the dominant pathways will be. Function 4c is about the monitoring, learning and steering of the transition. Function 5 about the creation of circular markets and withdrawal of non-circular markets. Function 6 is about the provision and allocation of resources. And finally, function 7 about the legitimacy for the mission and its potential solutions. And the mapping of the functions based on events revealed several relations between the functions. And by mapping these sweet sequences of functions uh, by means of a Markov chain, modes of change and patterns were identified. And here you see the predominant sequences of functions we found by the an analysis analyzing the events. And we find several patterns that are particularly interesting. So first, it appeared that the entrepreneurial activities lead to convergence of the solution space while in return a clearer and more convergent solution such as modular elements led to more entrepreneurial activities. The second identified loop is that the client seemed to need the entrepreneurial activity to allocate funds and capacity while on the other hand next steps in entrepreneurial activity could only be made after clarity on funds and a formal assignment by the client side. The third loop was that both legitimacy from the client side and market formation to a new business model seemed to be preconditions for consensus on a solution towards circular infrastructure. In the next slide, I will go deeper into the meaning regarding particular observations in these loops. So we look for the more striking sequences into the qualitative data behind regarding the event sources to find reasons and explanations for these dynamics. So first, Perseverance of individuals resulted eventually in the support and the consequently also the resources. And these individuals were both in market parties and at the client, and they were closely worked together to get the ideas implemented. These processes were fundamentally different from how projects are usually approached in the sector. The circular viaduct was market driven and it turned to be a real struggle for the client to deal with such unsolicited proposals, most likely because of the procurement legislation. In follow up uh, initiatives, the public client took the lead and deliberately created suitable market conditions rather than being dependent on market initiative. Third, support of government, government officials was initially lacking because of there was no formal assignment, even though it fitted the client's policy goals. And only after the legitimacy was gained through championing by a senior public, public official, a formal assignment was created, which resulted in an allocation of funds to implement the innovation. And finally, in the early stage, uh, the interpretation of circularity affected the modular solution, as well as the modularity affected what others regarded to be circular. And this explorative process was cl uh, closely connected to knowledge development. In the process, the larger mission of becoming circular uh, remained the common team, and as such, the mission turned out to be key in the eventual solution. But what do these insights in this particular trajectory mean for the wider sector? The study showed that public infrastructure client has close to all the tools to steer the transition, yet needs the market to, for realization. This is the case in the entire public-led infrastructure sector, and is moreover expected to apply to other public sectors. And this observation feeds an important argument that although the transitions need to involve all the parties and all the elements in the system, public clients need to take a leading role because they have all the tools in hand. Second, the ambiguity of both problems and solutions create a large interconnectedness between knowledge development, knowledge sharing, exploration of the problem and 
exploration of the solution from the innovator's perspective. So it's therefore not only the formal mission arena in which policymakers set out the outlines, but also bottom up processes at the project level in which solutions and goals and solutions are gradually are gradually explored and in such cases developments on a micro level affect the policies and strategies in turn. And third, we saw that altogether the project success depended strongly on only several seemingly minor aspects that were not explainable to the functional misanalysis on a system level. And examples are the perseverance of individuals and large influence of a single individual within a single public client organization. And finally, the impact of the circular viaduct on circularity turned in terms of env environmental impact out to be very limited. However, the enthusiasm it created within the wider sector led to several initiatives regarding more circular initiatives. So this learns us that ways in which progress and success of, of those circular innovations are determined often don't do justice to the actual impact initiative have on the systems in the long run. And this is particularly important regarding the devel development of, for example, indicators for circularity or sustainability. Okay, so thank you for uh, your attention. I look forward to any questions and points of discussion. Thank you for that. Some great presentations there. I I, uh, I can't actually see. Uh, oh, sorry. I can see that we've got uh, a few points and a few questions. Um, I'm I'm going to start off with. Um, I, I suppose um, just really one for uh, a chini. Um, maybe if we can make a chini live. If we can find a in 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 the uh, list of people, make self known to us. Um, I, I, I mean, I think it's really interesting, certainly what we do when we're renovating uh, our buildings um, and um, the air quality issues. And I, don't, I think it's a really under-researched area. Um, and I, I'm, first and foremost, I'm interested in how, how you monitored, and I know you mentioned it, but in a bit more detail, how you monitored the uh, volatile organic uh, compounds. Um, and, and whether you think they thought there was enough precision in capturing uh, those impurities within that uh, compound. And, and whilst I saw that there was quite a bit of attention on what the construction workers were, were doing, I just thought, how, I wondered whether you monitored how far the particulates travelled within the building. Um, uh, uh, Ginny? Hi, Chris. Hi, I yeah. can hear you now. Yep. Yeah. Did you did you get my question there? Uh, is it for Padma or? So, so the, the the first the first question was really about um, the, the the monitoring of particulates and um, whether you thought you got the whether you were capturing all the particulates that you you needed to. Um, so. We, I just wondered whether you could quickly mention again, though, the, the strategies for monitoring and capturing those, um, and then whether, whether you're almost whether you've got the full range of particulates you thought you needed. And the second was really about how far the particulates might have travelled within the building. I think that question for Padma. Uh, and uh, is partner on the online at the moment? Padma, yeah, she is. Hi, Chris. Hi, hi. Is it, sorry, sorry, Fat Fatma. I, I, I misheard them. So, hi. Did you, did you get the question? Yes, definitely. Yes. Uh, there is, uh, there was a lab test done. Uh, yes. uh, then followed by a gas chromatography test where we tracked the emissions of the VOC and the particulate matters. Uh, it's mentioned with the percentage in the papers. You, you, and then you, the number, yes, and then the, the values were compared to the LEED standard in order to uh, LEED guidelines in order to determine whether or not they exceed uh, the, the, the accepted levels. Right, okay, okay. Now, and do you think do you think that the tools that you use captured all, all the particulates that you, you wanted? 
Uh, yes, and it was also um, confirmed by the results of the survey that we have done. And we have repeated the survey occasionally in order to capture the effect, the short and long term effect. Right. Okay. No. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Did you did you pick up how far the particulates had travelled, or or was that not part of the survey? You know, in terms of the in within the building. Well, actually, we couldn't actually map it spatially. If I get you right, if I uh, understand your question uh, properly, um, we couldn't map it um, uh, in order to determine whether or not they uh, or how they have travelled um, in the air. Uh, but these tests were done in a closed, um, uh, yes, in four closed educational spaces. So uh, this was different than uh, Akini's uh, research because Akini uh, investigated or tested the effect uh, in uh, both closed spaces and open spaces. But in our test, it was all four closed spaces. Okay, okay. No, right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Thank you. Just, just, just before I open up to the uh, to the to the floor, maybe, maybe Lloyd, can you have a look through the a few of the comment chat comments? And yeah. See who, uh, who uh, yes, Chris Pe Pekka has a question for Fatma uh, and, and all three of the group. Will you come up with any further recommendations upon one how to improve the education stroke programs at technical school, and two how to retrain workers ar around? Yeah. Well, first of all, best practices uh, should be uh, monitored all time because uh, from our research that the effect of uh, um, male uh, practice of wall painting affected the, the percentage of VOC. So this is uh, number one. Um, and number two, uh, taking the concept of or applying the concept of the sustainable building renovation is also a new theme that should be applied. Uh, uh, most probably uh, sustainability is looked uh, for new construction buildings, or at least for our context, but here uh, with our study, we pinpoint that it is essential mm. also for existing building during renovation process, uh, not only considering uh, taking or using green certified materials, because this was the case in our study, but the problem came with the uh, best practices of labor, which okay. uh, jeopardized the process. Great. Okay, thank you, Fatma. And then uh, Stina has two questions for you also. How old were the students in the study and how did you assess the SBS? How, I'm sorry, Lloyd, how old is what? How old were the students in the study? How old were the ages? How old were the students in the study? The age is from 18 to 21 for the students. Uh, okay. As for the staff, uh, I believe from 25 to like 50. Okay. 50 years, yeah. yes. Okay. And, and then the follow on question then is how did you assess the SPS? No, the SPSS is uh, a coming step because this is an ongoing uh, research. So we are going to include it in a paper which is now uh, under review. Okay. Thank you very much. I think there's a there's also a question to Tom, um, and and I'm I think I'm following a similar line of thought. Uh, Tom, would you argue that more uh, assets and project-based uh, approach circular viaducts is less suitable when moving towards circular asset lifecycle management approaches? Um, uh, I think uh, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um... Indeed, somehow, uh, you, of course, you need pilots because eventually a lot of work needs to be done there. But uh, I think that at the moment there's too much focus on those single projects while you have to really think about the long term if you talk about circularity. So I think it's, it's much more almost an organizational question or a question of asset management where the, really the large gains of circularity can be made. So, um, I, I wouldn't say that we shouldn't focus on, on single projects or single assets. Uh, also, for example, working in programs could maybe help, but uh, eventually we also should really think about how we organize construction um, in a broader sense. So not only in, in making new assets, but also in ma maintaining them and how the relations between all the actors involved are organized. 
I, I mean, I, I also really liked your question of how people were, were, were developing, uh, I suppose, the, the structures and then creating interest and then, and then generating um, an economic interest, uh, an economic mar market. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in going back through your presentation and getting your thoughts, but I can see there's a lot more detail behind that in certainly how you group together those areas to, to, de to, to determine that, that, that there were shifts in the way that people will be behaving to stimulating their own market for the circular economy. Just any, yeah. any, thought, any thoughts on that? Is, that? is that right? Is it wrong? Should it, is, are there other approaches? Um, I mean, somehow it should be a viable business case. So I don't think it's, it's, it's wrong because uh, an, uh, a contractor also needs to survive. But so I think it's a good thing that new markets are created in this sense. And here, for example, instead of just procure, procuring a solution, they had a, like a collaboration agreement in which they co-develop between client and contractor. So the, I think these kinds of markets or new business models are, I, I think even essential to, to make this shift. I did. I did wonder whether there was almost nothing new there, in the, uh, apart from the fact that we're looking at circular economy and sustainability. I'm wondering whether or not this is a repeat of previous business models. And then, once somebody does ma manage to create a, 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 a distinct business strategy and distinct business market, then somebody else comes in and buys the company. You know, a bigger company. And I, ju I just wondered whether. We're just seeing things at a very early stage here and some of the uh, innovation funding or early projects uh, uh, are, are really just an indicator of a, of a field at, at an early stage of maturity. Yeah, probably probably that's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely that you, in any case of pilots, uh, you, you need to have those kind of, of like strange ways of collaboration. But... Um, yeah, eventually things should uh, be become like an, a new normal if you really want to make this transition. So on the long term, uh, it's not just having all those strange innovative uh, tenders, but it really sh should become part of normal practice. But that's not what is shown here in this presentation. Uh, Lo Lo uh, thank thanks for that, Tom. Lloyd, are there any other questions in the chat? Yeah, there's a, a follow-on question from um, from for Tom. Very interesting presentation. Nice to hear more on the circle of viaducts. I've got a question in regarding to the dependency on enthusiastic individuals. Do you think this is a, vu a, a vulnerability for the transition? And if it is, is there a way to get past it? Um, yeah, interesting question. Um, I think at, at such an early stage of the transition, I mean, circularity has only been a real topic since, let's say, 2016 or 17. Uh, so in this early stage of such a transition, I think it's, uh, it's really what fits this stage. So people are just becoming enthusiastic, uh, trying to do the things they can. The, the solution pathways are also not clear yet. So uh, eventually we need not to be dependent on those individuals but i think that it, it is completely logical that that is what's happening now so if if the question is that a vulnerability uh, if it stays that it is dependent on only single individuals definitely but i guess that in in the long run it will become uh, more widely shared okay and I've, got then, a, I've got a quick question for um, for Achini. Yeah. Um, I, I was really interested in the the why people did things, and I wondered whether or not um, there's uh, uh, a need to to look at. I mean, almost what they do and why they do, and then when they do it. I wonder whether there was a need for observation to determine whether or not people were actually doing um, what they thought they were doing um, and how that was affecting their perceptions or behaviours. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for the question. 
So uh, this, uh, this, this study is based on the pilot survey. So here I am, I just uh, roughly look to uh, with the identified uh, occupant behaviors and comfort preferences in the literature, I just check whether uh, people engage with these occupant behaviors and for which reason, for which uh, to gain which comfort uh, preference, to achieve which comfort preference. But uh, then in the next stage of the research, I am focusing on uh, when, when uh, when they are uh, taking these actions, like uh, are they taking these actions regularly or, the, uh, or are there any time pattern like uh, in the morning, are there, some, uh, are there any behaviors are in peak or in the evening or, or just in the daytime likewise. Or, uh, and also I am looking at uh, how behaviors differ when according to the different seasons like summer and winter mainly. So uh, uh, through these uh, studies I'm targeting to identify why and when these behaviors occur. So uh, main uh, uh, other than that uh, there is some gap between the uh, organization and occupants like occupants require some different uh, comfort preferences but organizations mainly some uh, organizations which mm -hmm. determines this is the uh, comfort uh, requirement that we can provide for the occupants like uh, if we consider a uh, fully air conditioned building so uh, if the occupants the occupants do not have control over the air condition and control over the uh, windows and those building systems so uh, so occupants have to adapt with the uh, current uh, in the environmental conditions so uh, uh, these are the main in the pilot study these are the uh, main uh, main findings i have identified and later on uh, later on uh, on the research i am trying to identify like uh, uh, which behaviors are in uh, if, if if recognize one one particular building or uh, consider different building with different ca characteristic how different are the behaviors like if you consider uh, uh, building with natural ventilation uh, uh, how the behaviors differ or building with uh, mechanical ventilation how these behaviors can be different so likewise uh, at the behaviors and the factors will be identified in the, uh, the next stage. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, obviously, that'll be interesting to see how that develops once you see what people are actually doing. Oh, I, uh, another question for Ashini from Mahid. Uh, Ashini, um, do you think that the social practices have to be understood by the designers in order to improve sustainability within the built environment. Yeah, absolutely. There's a gap like, uh, mainly my research is focused from the energy point of view, but uh, uh, the energy models are, uh, modulus forces comes after the designers when, when they design the building. So, uh, so uh, the uh, this uh, research is focusing on uh, like uh, during the energy modeling process, which factors we should identify in terms of occupants' behavior. So like uh, their presence and movement, how those uh, characteristics we should uh, uh, use for the energy modeling. So so for the designers also, we should. Uh, 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 it's like once we identify these uh, ideas for the energy modulus, then we can uh, give them to the uh, designers as well. Uh, so then they can design the building as per the uh, occupants uh, requirement. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that answers the question for Mahid. 
Um, so, so Pekka has um, in the chat, thanks, Achini. Likewise, any thoughts about the en enhancement of occupants' energy savings behaviours in the future? What kinds of carrots and or sticks does such sustainable actions belong to employers and also property owners? Yeah, like as I mentioned previously, in the uh, apart from the this question uh, with occupants, I have also conducted some interviews with the organization management. So their point of view is a bit different from the uh, occupants because uh, they think for the, uh, the absolutely th that occupants uh, bring in their portable heaters so something like that. It's a, a um, cost cost for the energy cost for the organization when they use uh, or practice these behaviors <clears throat> during the operational state. So. Uh, for the uh, organizational management or building building managers, uh, uh, when they identify the occupant behaviors, uh, they should actually think about it because uh, their main focus is on the uh, hierarchy. Like uh, their their uh, strategies are all coming with the uh, economic aspect as well. So, but uh, considering the occupants, uh, they uh, they they should uh, conduct some awareness or programs as well for the um, occupants, and uh, they should conduct feedback. Uh, like they can, they should collect feedback as well. Uh, in 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 case like if any retrofitting or something, some some energy saving technology uh, is introduced to the organ uh, the building so uh, they the building managers expect to uh, occupants to follow that uh, any like any energy saving uh, uh, technology like uh, introducing central air can enter central ac system or something but uh, uh, then uh, but if the occupants are uh, occupants prefer different, uh, like the temperature levels or something, they eventually go for uh, opening windows. So just changing the temperature level and all these uh, uh, for all these adjustments. So then it will affect the uh, energy consumption of the building. So uh, building managers should uh, consider the occupant preferences and they should carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, integrate these preferences when they introduce in the uh, energy uh, efficient new technologies to the organization. Thank you. Uh, I've got a quick question from Tom, which I think picks up on the uh, some of the questions in the chat. Um, um, and he was talking about some, one of the other, uh, Leon had uh, mentioned that uh, um, uh, did recycle uh, a roof covering, shredded it, and then took it 200 kilometers to a new place. Um, but I, I was thinking when I was looking at your uh, modular concrete units, they're not so dissimilar from, uh, I think they were concrete, but some of the modular units, um, not so dissimilar from some of the units I see in the UK on some of our bridges. Um, and um, I often think, well, they must have been done for speed and, uh, uh, um, and effectiveness in their first construction. And I've always thought, will they be used again? And I've never seen concrete reused. Like I've never seen concrete planks, concrete beams reused. Now, I, that might be just me, but uh, I just wonder, you know, what, what do we think the chances of, uh, uh, of concrete in its, origin, in its original prefab, precast form being reused again? Yeah, that's more a, a man managerial question, but uh, this fire that I was here talking about, it was already built on a construction site and also deconstructed. And now the, the, the several modules are at a, just at a, as a storage place waiting for our next life. So technically it's possible. Only a thing is that it uh, legally, uh, it cannot be uh, used yet in, 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 uh, like regular roads. So um, 
so I think technically this is possible, but uh, there, there are a lot needs to change that it's also really uh, adopted in practice. So that's also what I said before. This is really this pilot stage still. People are exploring what the various uh, ways are to to design and construct such circular viaducts. So, um, yeah, I think it, it really needs some years uh, uh, that it really can be implemented also in, in more regular things. Because the big advantage, of course, is when you have all those uh, segments, those bridge segments, which are just standardized blocks and you can reuse them like six times so every time a functional change in a road is that you can uh, just uh, adapt the, the the viaduct or take it apart and construct it somewhere else but uh, th that's more a man managerial question more uh, related to asset management than to really this design of those blocks I think there's a, there's probably and also a bit of a challenge with concrete in that um, there's so many variabilities as you mix it, and then also once it's constructed, how it's performed in its life, and you know whether carbonation's taken place and or any degradation of the concrete. And I, I know I've been involved in projects where you're just looking at can the life of the concrete be extended, and I can see that it's easier to crush the concrete and reuse it and get approval for its reuse than it is to even extend the life of concrete and yeah. and and get that approved in safety terms it, it, yeah. it's, it's just one of those issues that, and the same would would stand for steel but we we, we seem to accept it because it's it, it, it is a a more homo, uh, homogeneous product possibly yeah and, and with steel there's more experience with reuse i guess so yeah. uh but I think it is definitely possible uh, also with the, the monitoring um, techniques that are currently being developed to, to, to do non-destructive uh, uh, test the quality of the, the, the used concrete. So I think there are definitely uh, possibilities. But for real implementation, uh, it's still a long way, I would say. Have we got time for one more question from the audience, Lloyd? Or? We have. We're at 11.12 at the moment, and we, we can go as far as 11.15. So, yes. Is there, is, is there another question in the chat or anybody wants to pose a live question? Would I like to get just would like to test out our function, our ability to make you live? Anybody want to go live? Yes, please. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't look like there's anybody no, wanting no takers, to. No. Yeah, but please, please, in the next few sessions, please show your interest in making vocal voice, real voice questions. Um, I, I think I think with that, I, I think I'll bring this session to a close. I really would like to thank all, all my uh, speakers and all those who have joined in the uh, presentations and, and the discussions. So thank you to Achini, Tom and Fatima. Um, some excellent presentations. Um, uh, the, the benefit of having the video is we will all be able to watch them again. And I certainly will be going over those and dipping back into those as well as going looking at the papers. It's nice to look at them alongside the papers in your own time. But thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you for what is a, a very lively chat. And please uh, say I, in the next sessions, I want to have a, have a go at speaking. Please, I want to ask my question verbally rather than just in the chat. Um, we, we want to try and get uh, our com as lively as possible. But thank you. Um, we'll now bring the presentation to the, this session to an end.